So I'm going to talk about the immune response to the virus, and uh, I'm going to start by describing some of the things we know about the immune responses. Then the uh, latter part of the talk will be about some of the uh, illustrations we have from uh, my lab studies and other studies of when the virus uh, immune response actually is deleterious. And of course, this is relevant for COVID-19 because there's uh, lots of evidence that uh, the, much of the disease is actually the immune response to the virus. We're still uh, working out many, many of the details there, but it seems as the virus uh, replicates and the host responds, there's dysregulation of the immune response and it causes uh, many of the pathological findings that we see. So just to, I think some of these things may have been covered a bit already, but there's four co common cold uh, coronaviruses, 2298HK1, NL63, and OC43. OC43 and 229E have been identified for, oh, probably about 40 or 50, actually more like 50 or 60 years now. HKU1 and NL63 were identified after the SARS epidemic in 2003. They cause up to 15 to 30% of common colds. And one feature of them is that there's no durable immunity. There's frequent cycles of infection. And the more we know about, of course, about COVID-19, this is a characteristic that both occurs and is something we worry about. Upper respiratory infections are most common. Lower respiratory infections are uncommon, but they occur in aged and immunocompromised patients. Again, a common theme of what we're seeing with COVID-19. These viruses all like to uh, infect the lungs of people who are more susceptible or have some underlying morbidity or are aged. And of course, there's no antivirals or vaccines for the common cold coronaviruses. And uh, the common, what we know about immunity is that many of these viruses induce an antibody response, but the antibody res response either wanes or is transient. Uh, but I think it's, the best study is one from 1990 from the Kao et al, where they inoculated 15 volunteers with 229E. 10 of them with lower antibody titers became infected and eight developed colds. A year later, they challenged this group Nine became reinfected and there was virus shedding still. We don't know how much virus shedding, and this is of course important as we think about vaccines in the context of COVID-19. None of these nine people developed the cold, however. So, so from this, we can say common cold coronaviruses do induce an immune response. It's not uh, durable, but it, it lasts for a while and it does protect against developing disease. And we, uh, we know something about vaccines from previous coronavirus infections as well. Most of these are in domestic and companion animals. So before people started thinking about coronaviruses in humans, the main interest of these viruses was in the disease they caused in either companion animals or in, or, or in food animals or uh, domestic animals. So we knew one of the diseases that we knew something about was feline coronavirus, which is normally a, a, a coronavirus that causes diarrhea in cats. But then every now and then it mutates while within the same host, while the host is persistently infected to become uh, feline infectious peritonitis virus. And this virus is uniformly lethal. And one of the things that makes it lethal is that instead of being just a normal a diarrhea virus, it now is able to infect macrophages. And this is fairly unique among coronaviruses, not completely unique, but fairly unique. And because of this, this is the only illustration of antibody-enhanced disease. So this is something, again, when people are thinking about vaccines, there's a big concern that, uh, that, that there'll be antibody enhancement. Uh, this occurs in feline coronavirus, but it may be the only example of this ever occurring in a coronavirus. The ones that we are most concerned with now uh, in human populations, uh, SARS-CoV-2 and in 20 years ago, SARS and MERS-CoV do not uh, productively infect macrophages, except occasionally for MERS-CoV. And then another illustration of vaccine is transmissible gastroenteritis virus, which causes fatal diarrhea in newborn pigs. People had worked on for years trying to develop a vaccine for this virus. And they, there was some success. It took a while to figure out what you needed was an IgA response in, in the uh, uh, milk of the uh, mother pig in order to protect the baby. But it turned out nature figured out how to protect pigs from this virus. A, vi a vi virus naturally arose that was uh, changed in just a few, uh, one area of the spike, the surface glycoprotein, and it no longer could bind to the enteric tract. It only could bind to the respiratory tract and mostly the upper respiratory tract. So the result was this was a great immunogen. 
and it basically eliminated the virus from uh, pig populations. And one consequence was that investigators actually working on TGEV had to find a new virus to work on because there was no more TGEV. So this is really a great illustration of how vaccination can work in coronaviruses. And we know from mouse studies from my lab and others that uh, antibodies are protective. They can be delivered passively if given one day prior to infection. And this, this may be relevant for understanding how convalescent plasma works or even more if we ever get to a cocktail of monoclonal antibodies, which I know are in clinical trials now. We know that virus-specific T cells in the absence of antibody are partially protective. Uh, we also know that uh, vaccination with live attenuated virus uh, is the most uh, protective way of immunizing animals. That's shown again by the uh, TGEV pig study that I described in the last slide. So the antibody responses in uh, uh, coronavirus-infected patients uh, we know that neutralizing antibodies are critical for protection against re-challenge. Are they uh, the only part of the immune system that does this? Probably not, because T-cells matter too, and T-cells do provide some protection. Uh, antibodies in, in MERS survivors uh, waned uh, rapidly, especially those with mild disease. And this is very so common in what we're seeing with COVID-19 now. The more mild the disease, uh, you may get an antibody response, but the more likely it is to be transient or to wane over the next few months. And of course, one of our goals with vaccination is to make sure that if we have a vaccine, that there's not a uh, substantial waning. Some of the studies with the MERS vaccines using the same platforms as uh, are being used for COVID-19 suggest that waning does occur. Uh, whether this is going to affect the long-term long -term protection is still unknown, but there's certainly evidence of waning even in that circumstance. And on the other hand, the SARS patients, SARS, most people got SARS got severe disease. There was very little evidence for asymptomatic disease with SARS. An initial study said that while the antibody responses can't be detected after six years, however, uh, more recent studies show that low levels of antibody can be detected for up to 12 years. And uh, my lab in conjunction with um, uh, Jin Sun Zhao's lab in uh, Guangzhou has detected uh, virus-specific neutralizing antibodies in 16 of 18 SARS survivors at the 15-year mark. So this, again, supports the idea the more severe the infection, the more likely you are to have a long-lasting antibody response. For these patients, I don't know how severe the disease was. I don't have that information. So this just repeats what I just said. Uh, just notice that the antibody titers are pretty low. They're between 1 to 80 and 1 to 140. For protection in humans right now, we don't have a really great number, but the guess is around 1 to 200 or 1 to 300 may be required for protection. So we don't really know if these people would be protected from SARS-CoV again. We know there's some cross-reactivity with SARS-CoV-2, but it's probably not going to be sufficient to be very protective, but maybe it'll do a little bit. And then there was also some cross-reactivity with MERS-CoV. So this, this is a slide that I did, uh, that my lab did with our collaborators in Saudi Arabia with Abir al shukari And looking at the yellow box or orange, yes, orange box uh, area, you can see that the, these patients had just pneumonia, not severe pneumonia, but mild pneumonia. And they initially had a positive ELISA antibody titer. And we like to do neutralizing titers, but they were not done in this study. And the uh, neutralizing titers were detectable at three months, had waned by 10 months, and then by 18 months, they were no longer detectable. Whether they'd be detectable by neutralizing titers, I don't know. We were able to, in many cases, detect neutralizing titers in uh, MERS patients who no longer had ELISA positive titers. So this, is, this part is not completely known. And so because of these questions of antibody uh, responses, we began to investigate T cell responses. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, CD4 and CD8 T cells are critical for clearance of infected cells. And when we started this, there was nothing known about T cell responses in MERS. And uh, we, as I mentioned how long antibody responses were detected in patients who had had SARS, uh, SARS-CoV, Specific T cells were identified as long as 11 years after uh, this, after the infection, and uh, again in conjunction with Jin Sun Zhao, we found that T cell responses were detected in the same SARS survivors. And uh, this, there was, and one point that's important is that there was no evidence of MERS specific T cell responses in uninfected humans. I say this is important because. 
this particular issue has confounded our studies of SARS-CoV T cell responses, as I'll mention in a minute. So just to summarize this part, T cell responses were detected in all MERS survivors and the length of, I, this, I didn't show this, but in published work, we show that the length of ICU stay correlated with antibody and CD4 T cell responses. And this is a, uh, consistent with the idea that the more severe the infection, the more likely you are to have a robust and long lasting antibody and T cell, CDA T cell response. Robust CDA T cell responses correlated with fewer days in the ICU. I skipped over a point, but it's, they were also in patients who died, they often had high CDA T cell responses, but that, that this is in survivors, so it's a little different scenario. So well, one implication of all this is that because we usually measure antibody titers, particularly by ELISA, is that we're missing some cases in prevalence studies. So what we do now is we, we tend to measure uh, we tend to measure neutralizing antibody titers in all our patients. I didn't show the data for that, but because we detect more patients using this method, this is our method of choice for identifying in infected patients. For SARS-CoV-2, it seems like our ELISA tests are better. There's so many more of them. There was only one uh, MERS or one or two MERS antibody tests, and they, they were, I think, fairly specific, but not so sensitive. So another issue is that uh, the T, I mentioned already this pre-existing immunity to COVID-19 uh, is confounding studies of the T cell response. So there's several studies now that show that there, you can detect SARS-CoV-2 specific T cells using activation markers. So this is you stimulate cells with peptides specific for the uh, virus proteins. And instead of measuring functional readouts like interferon gamma production, you measure activation markers. And the issue with this is the, the, we see a lot of the people doing this, see a lot of uh, people having um, responses to uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 proteins. And it's hard to know what this means. Activation markers are not specific, so, but there's something in the media that's activating the cells. And whether it's truly cross-reactivity or what it means is really unknown. We don't know if they're protective, they're pathogenic, but they are confusing. And it's, this is an area that definitely needs more work as we try to figure out why MERS-CoV had no cross-reactivity. SARS-CoV-2 seems to have a fair bit of cross-reactivity. And it's not, it's not against the usual proteins for the most part that are seen in the normal SARS-CoV-2 immune response. It's some of the non-structural proteins. So this is definitely a work in progress. So uh, the, for COVID-19 T cell responses, uh, we know from several studies now that uh, they're directed against all the structural proteins and also some non-structural proteins. As I mentioned um, earlier, some of the, just now in fact, some of these responses to structural proteins are hard to understand. They're, uh, they're not usually seen to great levels in COVID-19 patients, and they also don't cross-react with the uh, uh, common cold or seasonal coronaviruses, so we don't really know what they mean and where they came from. And sometimes we can detect even in SARS-CoV-2 uh, T cell responses in some patients who lack detectable antibody uh, titers. One of, the, one of the goals that we're pursuing is trying to identify specific HLA restricted epitopes. So this would allow us to uh, screen populations with a single pool of antibodies, uh, peptides rather, and this would uh, perhaps allow us to better characterize the T cell response. And we're slowly working up to doing that. This field is so uh, intense, it's so intensely studied now, of course, or there's so many people in it, that by the time we get going on what we do, that may, may be done by seven labs, but we'll see. And it's, uh, the T cell response is also important for measuring uh, vaccine efficacy, especially given some of the results we've had showing that T cell responses are more long lasting potentially than antibody responses. So uh, one minute on back, vaccine enhanced disease. This is a, of course, a big concern with vaccines coming on the market now. Uh, other than feline virus, which I mentioned earlier, there's no evidence of macrophage-enhanced ADE or antibody disease enhancement. But there is, though, is there's evidence from several studies in the past of changes in the character of the immune cell infiltration. Uh, this was seen when uh, inactivated whole virus is used. It's seen more in aged mice, associated sometimes with eosinophilia. Uh, I should say that none of these mice get sicker because of this. These are histological changes or pathological changes, not necessarily reflected in clinical disease. And there's one study in macaques that showed 
that immunization with a vaccinia virus expressing the S protein or taking antibodies from those mice and giving them to a second uh, macaques and giving to a second macaque before infection with SARS-CoV-2, there was a change again in the nature of the inflammatory response. It went from macrophages, went from wound healing to pro-inflammatory, and there's an increased expression of inflammatory mediators. But as in the other studies, the macaques didn't really care. They remained asymptomatic. So this is something as we, I'm on several committees that discuss vaccine uh, safety, and this is something we think about all the time. It's very hard to measure distinguishing these kind of enhanced respiratory uh, disease problems versus uh, vaccine failure. So I'm going to spend the last seven minutes here on uh, talking about when is the COVID immune response pathogenic. So the, I'll start with it by reiterating the vaccine studies that I mentioned above, where at least in the case of feline uh, coronavirus, uh, if you immunize with the surface glycoprotein under certain conditions, you can get enhancement of macrophage infection. This, of course, is the same as seen in dengue virus infections. And this, but this is the only illustration, really, of a pathogenic immune response that gives worse disease. I will show a little bit about mouse hepatitis virus-induced demyelination because it's a subject that I've studied for many years and uh, I think is a, it gives a good illustration of possibilities. And then uh, I'll talk for the last couple of minutes about dysregulated early immune responses, which and I'm going to show our data from SARS from a few years ago rather than COVID-19, which we are still in the process of doing. And uh, what I should say is that we, what we know from COVID-19 patients is that sometimes the immune response, the interfering response is uh, delayed or absent. Other times it seems to be present and uh, remains present for a long extend, extended period of time. So how this is exactly all playing out is unclear, whether it's a failure to induce an interfering response or a failure to induce, induce a properly regulated interfering response with people are still trying to figure this out. This of course is very important because if somebody has a delayed or absent interfering response, they might respond to exogenous interfering. And as I'll show in the next few slides, you wouldn't want to do that necessarily too late in the infection because it might have uh, negative consequences. So this is the mouse hepatitis virus slide, and I'm only going to show you the single slide. So the point of this slide is just looking at uh, the second row here. Let's see if I can get this to work. Yeah, so this row, this is a mouse you know, that's infected with mouse hepatitis virus. And this panel here uh, shows that there's lots of virus antigen in the white matter. These are all infected oligodendrocytes. And this is myelin and it looks basically normal. And this is axons running through the myelin, again, looking normal. And these mice have no T cells, which is why the virus is just infecting these cells and nothing else is going on. Now, if you take these same mice and give them T cells and wait a week, you now have complete destruction of the myelin. You have macrophage infiltration to a huge extent, and now the virus is cleared. So this is one of the things that's really interested me, as uh, Paul had mentioned, over the many, many years. How come the virus, how come the host cannot clear this virus without causing so much uh, tissue destruction? And this may be relevant for our understanding how uh, the human pathogenic respiratory coronaviruses work. So uh, what, a study that we did a little while ago was looking at interferon in mice with either SARS or MERS. And MER, uh, th as type 1 interferons are the mainstay of initial immune response, and they've been used both uh, prophylactically and therapeutically in various infections. So uh, we think it's really important to understand how, what they do and how they do it. So one of the things that this, the, my postdoc who did this, Rudra uh, Chana Panavar, who's now a prof assistant professor at the University of Tennessee, what he was able to do is he was able to take a biopsy mouse that normally gets quite sick with this virus, huge weight loss, death, and now if you infect a interferon knockout mouse on the same background, mice completely survive. So this was our first hint about how uh, interferon responses could actually be pathogenic. And the other thing that he, showed, that he showed was that when you took away interferon, you actually didn't change virus clearance very much. This may be a slight delay at day three, but by day five, there was no difference in virus clearance. Uh, the other point to this slide, which will be important for the next slide, is that the virus titers are, almost reach maximal levels at 16 hours post-infection. They're slightly higher at 24. And for anyone who works with other respiratory uh, viruses, this is hugely fast and hugely high. And one of the things we notice is that the interferon response lagged. 
So here the, the response is 48 hours peaking, yet we saw virus peaking uh, at, um, 14, at um, uh, 16 to 24 hours. So th this we thought might explain some of the pathogenesis. All these other factors also peak later, CCL2 and TNF, which are important cytokines and uh, chemokines. And then what uh, Ruchu was able to do is if you deliver interferon six hours before the infection, and so taking away this lag, now mice were completely protected and they survived and they lost much less weight. So again, su su supporting the idea that the timing of interferon is really critical for, uh, in relation to virus titers to predict outcomes. And so now going to a second virus, and I'll come back to put this all together in a couple of minutes. But if you get in MERS, the opposite was true. So interferon was protective. If we took mice and now infected interferon knockout mice, now they all died. That's showed in the red box area. And virus clearance was also delayed. And then, but here, here's the, I thought was a, a piece of a slide that gives us some information about what's going on. Here the virus titers peak at two days and interferon peaks at two days. So there's none of this lag that we saw with SARS. And then what we could also show here is that now if you treated, if you gave a lethal dose of virus and uh, at six or 24 hours before infection, now mice didn't lose weight and they were completely protected or not completely, but almost completely protected in terms of survival. And virus was also cleared much more rapidly. These are the interferon treated mice. And you can see here, it's particularly obvious here. So interferon again, preceding the virus infection was uh, protective. And on the other hand, if we mimic the SARS situation and let virus peak and then gave uh, interferon, now we saw we could, uh, we had a uh, lethal outcome. So uh, this is the mice, this is with a sublethal dose of MERS, so mice would not die or a few of them die, that's shown in the blue. And in red, when you give virus either two days after infection or four days after infection, uh, you have a great decrease in survival, much more mortality. So, and the same thing's true in SARS. If you give a sublethal infection where few mice die, you give interferon during the infection, now they all die. So the basic point of this is that it's really important that we know the relationship of when the, the, uh, immune, the innate immune response and the virus are, uh, work, are um, functioning compared to each other. Uh, what, what these mice experiments show is that um, it's really key that the interferon response as much as possible precede uh, the peak of virus replication. And we know from SARS in 2004 that patients who did poorly, many of them, not all of them, some of them had no interferon response, but many had prolonged type one interferon expression. And when this was shut off, antibody responses developed and patients survived. And so this is important for thinking about the use of exogenous interferon in uh, COVID and other acute infections. So I just wanna thank uh, Rudra, who, uh, Chana Panabar, who did most of this work, my long-term collaborator, your fearless moderator, Paul McCray, uh, Kun Lee, and then Jin Sun and Jin Xian Zhao. So thank you. Thank you, Stan. Uh, we've got several questions here. Um, see if we can knock off a few. Uh, the first one is, is it understood by which pathway feline coronavirus infects macrophages? I think it's by, uh, through its receptor. Uh, which it's a good question because I don't, I'm pretty sure it's the, through its receptor, which is APN, um, amino peptidase and protein. Uh, I know the enhancement is via the FC receptor, but I, I, I'm pretty sure that it's the two together are required. Okay. A second question uh, related to animal models. Are, are you surprised that SARS-CoV-2 is asymptomatic in uh, rhesus macaques? Well, SARS-CoV-2 is a, a pretty mild in about 80% of humans. So I think, I don't think we understand uh, pathogenesis very well yet. It's the 10 or 20% who get sick with uh, SARS-CoV-2 that, that are, we're concerned about, not the 80% who have mild infections or have colds. I do not know why rhesus macaques are resistant to uh, this or get very mild disease, but you know, there's common themes here because they're, they get mild disease after, disease after SARS-CoV, after MERS-CoV, after uh, SARS-CoV-2. And we also know that just like in humans, uh, children do not get severe disease for the most part with SARS-CoV-2, SARS-CoV, or MERS-CoV. So there's some common themes here about pathogenesis 
uh, that we that are really probably key to understanding how these viruses work and uh, why they seem to particularly infect and cause disease in people who have underlying conditions or are older. Mm -hmm. uh, another question, uh, considering that COVID-19 is an inflammatory disease, maybe the vaccine could exaggerate the immune response and you could have adverse events. Do you expect uh, immune damage from vaccines? Well, this is, this, as I mentioned during the talk, this is, of course, the thing we're all worried about, that there's going to be some adverse effects. So far, in all the people who have gotten either the MERS vaccines or phase one, phase two trials of um, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 vaccines, but what I've heard more about than anything else is sore arms, so local effects that are not, uh, not particularly worrisome. Um, in terms of worse disease, that's one of the things we're monitoring. And it, it, this is a key thing to try to figure out vaccine failure from worse disease. And so I don't think we know yet how this is going to pan out. Okay. Um, thanks. Another question. Um, how do cancer patients behave when infected by COVID-19, especially patients who go through CAR-T treatments? Is there any knowledge there? There's not much. There was originally it was thought that people didn't who had who were actually immunosuppressed did, didn't do as uh, poorly as other people. But in fact, now um, it, we think that immunocompromise is a uh, risk factor for more severe disease. I don't know specifically about people who are getting CAR T therapy how they're uh, responding to this. You certainly could imagine that you get. I don't know because you could imagine some protection. You could imagine worse disease. And so you just have to look at the data and see which it, which it is. Uh, a last question. Uh, dexamethasone is being used successfully to treat severe COVID-19 patients. What are the implications of this treatment in the development of efficacious or friendly humoral and cell-mediated immunogenic responses? Yeah, this is, I don't think we know the answer to the yet. yet. And this is always a concern that if you dampen the immune response uh, too effectively that you won't develop adaptive uh, T cell and uh, B cell responses. So I think this is still something we're still learning about. I think the, uh, the use of storage is an interesting phenomenon because we, when it was used in SARS, it actually led to worse outcomes, but that's because it was used at all times during infection. And now it's being confined to people who are sick in the ICU where their inflammation is clearly uh, contributing to worse outcomes. So it, it's really, I'm, I'm really pleased to see that it actually has a role there. I was very worried that it was going to be like SARS and lead to worse outcomes. But here, when virus loads are going down and people are, have clearly an inflammatory disease, it seems to be working. But I don't know what the effect will be on the uh, ultimate immune response. Okay, well, thank you for a, a great talk and uh, thoughtful answers to these questions.